in, in primary studies, analysis of variance is a subset of, of multiple regression. You can use multiple regression when you have continuous covariates and also when you have categorical covariates. Similarly, in meta-analysis, uh, subgroup analysis is a subset of meta-regression. You can use um, subgroup analysis when you have a single categorical variable and you're doing a one-way analysis of variance. But with meta-regression, you can have continuous covariates and categorical covariates, and you can mix and match. You can look for interactions. You can look for curvilinear effects. Basically, any things that you would use a uh, multiple regression for in a primary analysis, you can use meta-regression for in a meta-analysis. And the constraints are similar. Um, th the question is often asked in primary studies, how many subjects do you need for every covariate? And there's a rule of thumb, I think, that it's 10 persons per covariate. It's a, it's a rule of thumb, obviously. You're going to have pretty poor power with that, but less than that, it's considered to be inappropriate. And similarly, I think they simply carried that number over to meta-analysis, and they said for every covariate, you should have 10 studies. Again, it's a rule of thumb. It probably works reasonably well. But um, I'm not going to obviously you know, have time over here to discuss everything about meta-regression, but I'm assuming that most people know how, to, um, know how to use multiple regression, and everything that you do there carries over. So for example, if you have dummy coding, effects coding, contrast coding, any of that applies over here, uh, linear, curvilinear, extra linear, all of those things apply over here in exactly the same way. Um, the example that I'm going to be using is this example from Berkey et al. Um, and uh, what these people did was in the last 15 years or so, there's been a resurgence of tuberculosis in the United States, including uh, many cases of drug-resistant tuberculosis. So whereas people had not been terribly concerned about this for a while, they're becoming more concerned about it. And the researchers wanted to know if this vaccine called the BCG vaccine was effective in preventing tuberculosis. Now, it turns out that going back over a number of years, um, there have been quite a few, I think 11 or 13 studies that were done that looked at the impact of BCG. The studies were all done using pretty much the same model. Um, the researchers show up in whatever the test site is. Half the uh, people are given the vaccine, half the people are given a placebo, and you follow them over time and see what proportion of them develop TB. And I think they used a risk ratio, and for example, the risk ratio of 0.20 would indicate that the risk of getting TB was 80% lower for patients that got the vaccine versus patients that didn't get the vaccine. And, and that's, that's the analysis we're going to be looking at. And the reason I'm using this particular data set is because everybody uses this data set. Um, if, if you go through all the books on meta-analysis that talk about meta-regression, I think there are four that discuss meta-regression, and all four of them use this data set. And now with ours, it's, our book, it's five. And, and what I wanted to do is to, is to, you know, for people, generally people that are doing this look at more than one book, and I wanted to make sure that they could look at the same data more than one way so they're familiar with it. The problem with this data set is that it has only 11 or 13 studies in it, and we're going to be using three or four covariates. So we're, we're, not, we're not abiding by the rule of thumb that says you need 10 studies for each, um, for each covariate. I, do, I don't want to... Um, I don't want you to suppose that what I'm trying to do is to tell you that this is okay. We're simply using this for educational purposes. This is what everybody's done. And so the statistics are okay, but we're going to have really wide confidence intervals. And you'll see, for example, one of the subgroups has only two studies in it. You wouldn't want to be doing that in, a, in, a real, in the real world. Um, so here's the thing. They looked at this. Um, I'm going to open up the program in a minute, and you'll see. But it turns out that... that there's a lot of variation in the, in the effectiveness, the efficacy. There's a lot of variation in how well the vaccine works. In some cases, the risk ratio was 0.20. In other cases, the risk ratio was 1.0 or something in that area. And it also turns out that most of that variance was probably uh, real differences between the true effect sizes. So the question is why? And obviously, it's a very important question because if what they're trying to do now is to bring this back to the U.S., We'd like to be sure that whatever it is that made this very effective in some studies is something that we're able to replicate in the U.S. Well, the people that were doing the research had two hypotheses about why this might have been more effective 
in some studies than, than others. There were some studies done, I believe, in India and in some, trop other, in some tropical climates. There were some that were done in Chicago. There were some that were done in Canada or Alaska. And as you got closer and closer to the equator, the studies became, the, the, the vaccine was less and less effective. And they thought there might have been two reasons for this. The first thing is that in Alaska, the way this worked was they would take the vaccine, put it in a freezer, send it up to Alaska, and they, where they would again put it in a freezer. And if they didn't, you know, who cares? It's pretty much the same thing. Whereas in, at the equator, they would put it in a picnic basket with ice, they'd send it down there. It was great for the first 24 hours, and then for the next nine months, not so much. So by the time they gave the vaccine to the people, it had lost all of its potency. So that was their, their thinking. Now, obviously, what would have been much better is to go back and actually track how these things were, were handled in each case. But in many cases, the data simply weren't available. You know, the authors had, you know, weren't reachable for one reason or another. The other uh, hypothesis that they had is that uh, tuberculosis was more prevalent in general um, in, in those uh, warmer climates, and therefore many people have developed natural immunity to it. Whereas in Chicago, we didn't see it that much. And therefore, the vaccine wouldn't be effective compared to placebo when people weren't, you know, they, they had natural immunity anyway. Um, but in any event, what they did was they went back and looked at latitude as a predictor of effect size. Now, this over here, because we're working with regression, and because this is linear regression, I'm plotting this against the log risk ratio rather than the risk ratio. On the x-axis, we have latitude, and you can see the latitude of 13, which is, which is relatively close to the equator, the log risk ratio is zero, very close to zero, which means that the risk ratio is very close to one. By contrast, when we get up here to Chicago and Alaska, the log risk ratio is minus one and a half. Uh, I can't, it's, it's hard to see exactly, but the risk ratio we're looking at is more like 0.20 uh, or so. So we do see a very, um, a very strong effect, and I'll show you that in a minute in the program. The other thing is, is um, I want to give you a sense of where we're going. When we don't have any predictors, when we simply look at the 13 studies and we look at how those effect sizes are dispersed, we get something like this. We see that they go from, from plus 0.5, which is actually a risk ratio of about one, about one and a half, all the way down to minus 1.5, which is a risk ratio of about 0.20. And again, I have drawn that normal curve over there to say that approximately 95% of the true effects fall within that range. So basically, this thing that you're seeing over here is, is TOR, the standard deviation of true effects, um, times four. So that if, if TOR is equal to this, I take two TOR above the mean, two TOR below the mean, and I get that dispersion. Once we add latitude as a predictor, and now the pre see, over here, in a sense, when we're talking about the mean, the prediction line is simply the mean effect. And so we, we're drawing the dispersion curve about the mean effect. Once we have a regression line, as we do over here, the predicted effect for these studies in Chicago is, 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 is like this. We're saying that once you have a study done in a very cold climate, we would expect those effect sizes to fall within a relatively narrow range. This is now the tour that we're talking about. And once you move up here to the, I don't know what, maybe to the southern, southern United States, this is the tour that we're talking about, this. So that um, you can sort of get the gestalt that whereas over here you need something this wide to capture 95% of the studies, over here you only need something this wide to capture 95% of the studies. I mean, clearly we're missing a few of them. I mean, these don't fall in that range, and this one doesn't, but these do, this one does. And I mean, I, I've sort of plotted this at arbitrary points. If we put another one over here, it clearly captures those. So the point is that if only, the only thing we know is that it was a study done, one of the 13, the unexplained variance is pretty big. But once we use latitude as a predictor, the unexplained variance shrinks. Now we have a, a pretty um, narrow uh, range of effect sizes when we're looking at them relative to that regression line instead of looking at them relative to the mean. In fact, I mean, just to be clear, if you took all of these dots and simply collapsed them up against the left-hand side, this is exactly what you'd have. All I've done, right, so those, the, the, the vertical position of those dots, see this one over here is this one. Uh, this one over here is this one. I haven't, I haven't moved the vertical position, I've simply moved the horizontal position. 
So you can see them on this scatter plot relative to their, um, to their latitudes. Now, given that, what would happen if you actually put a number on this and then you put a number on, on that? The ratio of, of, the, um, of that to this, um, or the, if, if that's the true variance using, the, using, using latitude, and this is the true variance, let me put it this way, if that's the error variance when we have latitude, and this is the error variance when we don't have latitude, then the ratio of one to the other is going to give us the variance that's been explained by latitude. And that's, so we're able to compute a, a, something that's analogous to R squared, the proportion of variance explained by the predictor. Uh, yes? That's exactly what it is. Yeah, I'm, I'm calling it the error variance in the sense that it's variance that that's true variance that we can't we can't explain. It's simply variant between studies. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So that that's where we are going with this. Let's open up the um, program, or I will, and um, it's over here. And I'm simply going to open up the spreadsheet to save time. And this is called the BCG data. And you'll notice that over here, OK, the, the, the data format you're familiar with, over on the right, I have created three um, moderators. The first one, if I double click on this, you'll see that it's latitude. And it is an integer uh, moderator, which means that we can use it in regression. We can't use it in, um, in subgroup analysis. Year is a, an integer moderator. And allocation is a categorical moderator. The idea over here is that in some of these studies, they used random allocation. Uh, basically, you know, people, you know, they had an envelope and, and it said vaccine or placebo. And some of them, they used alternate allocation, one vaccine, one placebo, and so on. And in some of them, they used something called systematic allocation. I don't know what that means, and also I think the people, it's possible the people that wrote the article doesn't know, don't know what that means, but it's something that's neither alternate nor randomized. And the, the point, I mean, this basically was developed, I, I think, in large part as an exercise, but if you're concerned that the treatment effect might depend in part on how the allocation was done, then this is a, basically a, a categorical variable, and you can look at, at that. So let's go to the analysis. We, we click on Run Analysis. And over here, we have the usual um, things. We have the columns over here for the uh, effect size and so on. Also, if you click on something like this, View uh, Columns, Moderators, it will give you a list of all of the moderators that you have that you've defined. And you can sort of take them and, and drag them and drop them onto the screen. In this case, I've already dragged all of them onto the screen. And therefore, these are showing up in, in blue. But let's say that I was going to hide allocation, uh, and I was going to hide year, and I was going to hide latitude. In this case, I could simply take latitude, I'm sorry, and drag it. I click on that and drag it over to here. And now, if I look at this, first of all, I'm going to change the scale. This is a log risk ratio. I'm going to change the scale so that it's like this. And you can see that if I, if I sort this, from low to high, there is quite a bit of dispersion in the effect sizes. If I click on this thing up here and choose risk ratio instead, just to give you a sense of, of where this is, and again, I sort by that, sort by risk ratio, you can see that we have one study over here where the risk ratio is 0.20. And then we have them all the way up to this, where the risk ratio is, is greater than 1. Now, obviously, the confidence interval over here is very high. I wouldn't make a lot of that. But over here, the confidence <laughs> interval is extremely narrow. And clearly, you know, there, there's something going on. This study um, the, the, the is, is clearly different from this one and, and from this one and so on. And if you sort by latitude, you get a sense that as you get closer and closer to, as you get further and further north, 
the effect sizes tend to get larger and larger. Uh, there's some disparity. I mean, it's obviously not a straight line. The study here is a little bit out of whack, and so is this one. But you generally see that. And so what we're going to do now is go back and actually run that as a regression. You click on analyses. You click on meta-regression 2. If, uh, and this, by the way, is the difference between version 2 and version 3 of the program. Version 2 has something called meta-regression, which only allows you to work with one covariate at a time and has limited options. Version 3, um, meta-regression 2 is what we have in version 3. And it, it really provides you with a lot of, um, a lot of options. So the first thing that we do is we come over here. And these are the uh, covariates that we had defined earlier. So I can, if you see latitude, the year, and allocation. If I click on latitude, I see that it is an integer variable with 13. Um, all th 13 studies have a value for that. None of them are missing. Year is the same thing. If I click on allocation, I can see that that's a categorical variable with three groups. OK, all that clear? Let me go back to latitude. And I'm going to click Add to Model. And what happens now is the program takes that. This is my model. I'm simply calling it model one. I put a check mark in there. And now if I click run analysis, um, I'm going to basically be running an analysis using latitude to predict effect size. The only problem that I have is that um, the button to run the analysis is over here someplace, and I can't access it with this. Let me see if there's any other way of uh, getting to that. Um, Ah, run regression, OK. So I run the analysis. And then we have, again, the option of using fixed effects or random effects models. Just to sort of um, be clear about this, um, the, the, the fixed effect model, remember, in, in, the, in, the, in the basic analysis, the fixed effect model says, OK, this is our mean. And all studies really share the same true value. All of the dispersion that we're seeing is, is sampling error. When you come to a regression, you no longer are saying that, to use the fixed effect model, you no longer are saying that all the studies share the same true value. What you are saying is that all studies at any point on the regression line share the same true value. So that basically, if there was no measurement error, if there was no sampling error, all of the studies would fall exactly on, on the regression line. And that all of the deviation that you're seeing from the regression line is, is simply sampling error. Uh, by the same logic that I said, that's, that's a difficult argument to make when we're dealing just with uh, a single sample or using the mean as the predictor. It's also a very difficult argument to make over here. And so in general, I think the random effects model makes more sense in uh, when you're doing a regression, the same as it does when you're doing a regular analysis. So I'm using the random regression model down here. When you do that, this is interpreted the same way that you would interpret it if you were doing a, a multiple regression in a primary study. You just need to remember that we're dealing with log values over here. So the prediction equation is the intercept, which is 0.25, minus 0.029 latitude. So basically, you would take the latitude, multiply it by this number, add the intercept, and that is the predicted effect size for each study. OK? It's, it's just a simple prediction. It might be easier if we were working with, with standardized mean differences or something like that. But the basic idea is to predict the effect size for any study. You take the intercept, and then you add this coefficient times that study's latitude. The more, and, and, and as somebody pointed out before, that probably is, maybe we were talking privately, in general, we don't really care about the prediction equation that much. What we really want to do is figure out whether or not latitude was a significant, statistically significant predictor, how powerful a predictor was it. Well, for that, we come down over here. Um, remember when we were dealing with subgroups, we had a Q statistic that reflected the difference between the two subgroups? Similarly, over here, we have a Q statistic that reflects the impact of all of the covariates, except for the intercept. In this case, the only covariate that we have is latitude. So basically, this is a test of the model. It's asking if all, if, if the covariates, or in this case, if latitude is significantly related to the effect size. The Q statistic is 18, degrees of freedom is 1, 
the p-value is clearly statistically significant. So we can conclude that uh, latitude is related to the effect size. Again, obviously, it's an observational thing. We can't say that it's because it was hotter or colder. We can't say it's because the vaccines were stored better or not. We can't say it's because of the immunity or not. Um, and clearly, in this case, we really don't know which of those things it is or what combination of them it is. But we can say that as you get closer, closer and closer to the equator, the effect size gets smaller and smaller. Okay, so the first thing we're able to see over here is that there is a statistically significant relationship between latitude and effect size. Does latitude explain all of the variance that we saw? Well, remember before when we were talking about subgroups, we said in the, in the case of uh, subutramine versus Orlistat, we said that it explained some of the variance, but there were still unexplained variants within the, the Orlistat group. Similarly over here, what we're saying is that um, over here, clearly there's a, a lot of variance that's not explained. Over here, the amount of variance that's not explained is smaller, but still it's not, it's not zero. In other words, this, this dispersion that we're seeing still represents, still, still it, it's more than, than zero. Um, there is, even if we know what latitude a particular study was at, we can't uh, perfectly predict what the effect size is going to be over there. So latitude explains some of the variance and effects, but not all of it. And back over here again, that was what we're testing, the goodness of fit. Does the, does the model completely explain the variance that we're seeing in the data? Now remember originally, well, I, I guess I didn't show you that, but originally when there were no covariates, Tor square was 0.30. With the covariates, point square is 0.06. So that's the amount of variance once we've taken latitude into account. I square is 64%. And the way that you would interpret that is analogous to what we were seeing yesterday. Now this is the variance that we're looking at. Part of that um, is real and part of that is, is, is just the sampling error. What I've actually planted over there is, is the one, and I've tried to do this to scale, is the real variance. In other words, if I simply, if I came back over here and actually figured out how much variance there was for all studies at a given level. I mean, it's difficult to do since we only have one study or two at any level, but you know, it's sort of aggregated over all of them. If I actually plotted how much variance was observed, it would be larger than this. And this has been shrunk into about 64% of the original value, which means that I square is 64%. Is that clear? Okay, if, remember back on the, uh, when I was showing you the, the schematics yesterday of, of how much the, the, the effect size is varied, and if you come back over here, I said that um, if this is the observed variance and I square is, um, is 10%, then if we shrunk that, so that we, we remove the error and we're just left with the true effects, that, 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 um, that normal curve would only be about 10% as large as it had been, okay? So we have the observed dispersion and we have the part of that that's real. That's due to differences between studies. By the same logic over here, okay, I could have plotted, um, what you're looking at over here is the smaller one. That's the one after we've removed the error. If I had plotted this originally based on what we're actually seeing, this might have been like this, and this might have been like this. But I shrunk it by about 40% because I squared tells me that only 60% of that is real, the rest of it is just random error. 64% of the variance uh, uh, by um, After, okay, no, I'm sorry. After, but see, if we start originally, if we come down over here, we have Tor square as it was originally. Mm -hmm. and, in that, and if I actually come back to the program and I go back to um, file, turn to basic analysis, and I come over here and I look at Tor square, Tor square is 0 0.309, okay? So that's the, that's the amount of true variance there is originally. 
and tor square is 92%. So that means if I, if I basically come back over here and I look at how much variance there is across all of these studies, okay, that would be estimated as some number. But only 92% of that is real. So if I was to plot a, a normal curve that was meant to capture that, that amount of variance, I would then shrink it by, by 8% to get the true variance. And I'd be left with the variance that I, I would be left with is 0.308. So if I, if I went and actually computed the variance of these observed effects, I might get point, I don't know what, point 0.35. But I'm going to shrink it by 8% because I know that 8% of that is simply sampling error, and I'm left with the variance of point 0.31. And I draw the normal curve to correspond to that. So that's, that's in a sense, my, my true between-study variance. And it, it's a lot. I mean, there's obviously a lot of variance from one study to the next. But what if I drew a, a, a line through that, you know, comparable to the, based on the latitude, and instead of talking about how much variance there is relative to this mean over here, I talk about how much variance there is relative to that regression line. So it's no longer a question of talking about this versus this, and this versus this, and, and this versus this. Now we have a regression line, and I'm talking about, let's say the regression line goes from here to here, so I'm talking about the variance from here to here, and here to here, and here to here, oh, however that regression line goes. That's going to be smaller than the variance that we're seeing now. However, now that we have that variance, we have the same conundrum that we had over here. Part of it is, is sampling error, and part of it is real. What proportion of that is sampling error, and what proportion of that is real? Well, back when we were looking at this, and we had all of that variance, we're saying, you know, 92% of that is real. Um, 8% is error. So if, if instead of plotting the observed points, we plotted the real points, it would shrink a little bit, but it wouldn't shrink a lot. Now that we've explained the way a, certain, a, a lot of the true variance by using the regression, and we have now variance about the regression line, again, some of that is sampling error, and some of that is real. The part that's real is now 64% rather than 92%, because a lot of the true variance has been actually explained away by the latitude. Is that helpful? I, um, yeah. Uh, this is something that, you know, I, I'm trying, I, I think it's important, so I'm trying to present it, but I think very few people have ever thought this um, through um, before. And, and therefore, uh, I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll be able to go out there and, and put this into the field. N not just you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what do you say? There's that great line in Monty Python. He said, you know, what, you know, Jesus was there on the mount preaching. He said, what do you say? He said, blessed are the cheesemakers, for they shall inherit the earth. He says, you know, why the cheesemakers? No, no. He doesn't mean just the cheesemakers. He means people in the dairy business in general. <laughs> okay, so I don't mean just you. I'm hoping that many people in this room will, will, uh, <laughs> will take this out there and sort of, you know, help move the field forward a little bit at a, at a time. Um, Somebody, I'm going to go back to the regression now, but people have a question. Somebody, I thought I saw some hands. Okay. If we go back to the um, regression, analysis meta regression. So we have latitude, we add it to the model, we tick this, and then we go to um, analyses run regression. Okay, so over here I have, I have uh, the variance when we're computing it relative to the regression line. Here we have the variance as it was originally. And then if you talk about the proportion of variance which has explained, it's 79%. And the way that we get that, it's explained, I think, in, in the notes, but there actually is a um, show options, models, analyses. Um, there actually is a screen over here that will, that will show this to me. And in this case, I think I'm simply going to have to change the resolution a little bit. I apologize to the people in the back. We'll get back to this one soon. But if I change the resolution, let's say, to here, see if that does it. OK. So you can see over here, there's a thing called more results. And um, if I click on more results, 
I get this thing called the R-square graphic, and this tells me, this explains where the R-square comes from. Um, that if we look at all of the variants, initially if we don't have a moderator, but this is all of the variants that we had, and if you remember back to a minute ago, I-square was 92%, which means that 92% of the variants that we were looking at was variants between studies. When we move on to the uh, regression, we don't care about this variance over here anymore. That was simply error variance. But we take the true variance, which turned out to be 0 0.308, and we subdivide that into variants which can be explained by latitude and variants which can't be explained by latitude. The proportion that can be explained by latitude is 79%, and that's what we're calling R squared. Okay, again, the computation is done for you automatically. In the book, we give the formulas and some, and some examples. Other things that we can do over here is we can look at the, um, at the scatter plot, and you can see over here, this is the same scatter plot that I showed you a little bit earlier. Um, one of the things that we can do, we can start off by just looking at the studies, and we have the option of making these studies proportional to the weight that they are given in the analysis or not. So if I come to uh, color, format, labels, help, there must be some way to do that that I don't remember, but okay, here's the, <laughs> I feel, you know, I'm not just doing this to, to but this is actually what I do when I forget how to run the program. Um, you add covariates, build a model, or run the analysis, and so on. Um, it's under um, format. Format? Uh, studies. studies. OK, thanks. OK, so we can make them one size <laughs> or make them proportional. So we've made them proportional. And then you can increase or decrease the size for them and, and everything else. So now I have all the studies. I can add a regression line to that. And then I can add the confidence interval to that. The confidence interval for this has exactly the same meaning as the confidence interval did yesterday on the main analysis. What we are saying is that the, the effect size for studies, remember yesterday when we had only one estimate, we said that the, the mean effect for the sake of argument is a, is a risk ratio of 0.5, and the true mean actually falls someplace in the range of 0.4 to 0.6. Over here, what we're saying is that for studies at a latitude of 30, the mean effect is, is this. It's, it's a risk ratio of minus point, a log risk ratio of minus 0.5. But the, we're 95% certain that the true log risk ratio for studies at this latitude is going to fall someplace between here and here. Or for studies with a latitude of 13, it's going to fall someplace between here and here. So this line over here is telling us how precise the estimate of, of, the, of, of this regression line is. And you'll notice that these lines up here are not parallel. They spread out towards the end because to the extent that the, um, that the regression coefficient is inaccurate, that's going to have more uh, of an implication as we get further and further away from the mean. And then we have the prediction interval, um, which tells us that for a study at this latitude, the mean effect is estimated to be over here. We're 95% certain it falls someplace between here and here, but that doesn't mean that all the studies are going to fall in this range. 95% uh, stu of studies are going to fall someplace between here and here. So you can see there's quite a bit of, um, of a range over there. The other thing that you can do is, let's say you're looking at this guy over here and you're saying, um, who is that study? Uh, I'd like to go back and take a closer look at it and find out why it's so far off the regression line. You can click Identify Studies, and then you click any study, and it gives you information about it. That guy happens to be Comstock and Webster, 1969. So it's a relatively easy way to pick out outliers. And this guy over here is Van de Vere et al, 1973. Uh, I'm going to close that. And then you have other things that you can do. Apparently, some of you know how to work this better than I do already. But you can, you can change the colors, the fonts. You can send this off to other um, programs. Um, in, oh, you can add the equation to the plot. Equation and plot, OK. Uh, format, yeah, insert equation. So it will actually take the um, equation that it's using to make the regression line and put it into the plot for you. Or you can change, uh, you can set the, the axis. I mean, let's say for the sake of argument, you're, you want to create a number of, of these plots. 
and you want to make sure that they all have the same y-axis. Uh, by default, it's just going to pick something that works for this data, but you can fix it so that the y-axis always has the same uh, top and bottom so that all the things are drawn on the same scale. I'm not going to bother with all of these things, but, but they are there. Something else that you can do is you go to uh, diagnostics. Um, there's something that will show you all of the studies and show you which ones are missing because they had missing data. Um, there's a models summary, which is simply a, a summary of what we saw on the main screen with, for model one, which in this case is the model that includes latitude, tau square is 0.06, the R square is 79, which means that latitude explains about 79% of the variance between studies. The test of the model has a p-value of that, which is the same value we saw on the main screen. And the goodness of fit has a p-value of 0.001, which tells us that there still is variance remaining that isn't explained by the model. Yes? This is none of this. The only thing that's available in CMA2 is a very simple thing. You're allowed to use one covariate. The only, it, it gives you very limited statistics for that. Yeah, so this is, I mean, we, we spent, you know, three years working on this. It's, it's a very, um, I've only be begun to show it to you. I mean, there's a lot more to come. But, yeah, I mean, it's, if, if you're not doing meta regression, then there's no reason to, to use version 3. Version 2 is just as good. If you are using meta regression, then it really does make a lot of sense to get version 3 because the, the differences are profound. I mean, there's really no comparison between them. Um, even if you have only one covariate, the kinds of st statistical options that you have to work with and the kinds of reports that are given are just vastly different. Why is that? Right. Okay, so, okay. Uh, I mean, over lunch, I'm happy to show you how to install version 3 and then you can play with it for a while. Okay, now, now here's where things start to get interesting. Let's say that we, we, we want to um, use allocation as an additional covariate. We believe that part of the variance might be explained by the fact that some of these studies use random allocation and some use systematic allocation and some used um, uh, alternate allocation. And we see that as a nuisance variable. And we want to covary that. We want to get rid of that and then look at the impact of latitude once we've, you know, over and above allocation. Okay. Or, you know, let me, let me take a simple, let's start with year. Maybe we think that, you know, that as, you know, that, that year, um, as the year varied, that was also an important factor. And maybe part of what we're seeing for latitude is just a confound with year. So I've added year to the equation. I've put a tick mark next to it. I click run regression. And now what we're getting over here is this, as, exactly as would be the case in a, in a primary analysis. We're looking at the impact for latitude. The p-value has now gone from whatever it was before to 0.002. This is now latitude with year partialed. And we're looking at the impact of year with latitude partialed. So the p-value for that is 0.683. Before, when we looked at statistics for the whole model, the only uh, covariate in the model was latitude. And therefore, the p-value that we were getting over here was identical to the one that we had up there. Now, however, we actually have two covariates in the model, latitude and year. And we want the ask of both of those together are uh, predictive of the effect size. So this is now a test with two degrees of freedom, one for latitude and one for year. The Q value is 14, and the P value is three zeros and a seven. So this tells us that those two together predict a significant amount of the treatment effect. Again, we have the goodness of fit test. Tor square has now dropped from 14 to 09. Uh, with Q statistic, P value. Again, what we're seeing is that even with both variables in the, uh, in the equation, there is still a significant heterogeneity remaining. And R square, using both of these in the model, is now 70%. Now, um, as is the case for any uh, primary regression, basically looking at this, you're looking, you're looking at each one with everything else partial. If you go to this thing over here called increments, um, you're going to get something similar. We have each line over here represents a separate uh, regression. The first line is using only the intercept, so R square is 0%. The second line is using only latitude, so R square is 79%. And we get a p-value, and we get a goodness of fit. And the change from the prior model R square has gone from 0% to 79%, so the change is 79%.
and then we get a test of the change. Moving from no covariates to one covariate, the p-value for that is 0 0.000, a lot of zeros, and then a four. Uh, and then we run a third analysis, this time adding year. So now the total R square is this, the test of the model is this, which is the same thing that we saw on the main screen. The goodness of fit is this, the change in R square, R square has actually gone down. And then we get a test of the change, which is 0.68. Now, the first question that I asked when I saw this is how can R square go down? If you're working with primary studies, as you add covariates, R square can only go up. And the answer is because the way that R square is being estimated, it's because we are repeatedly, repeatedly re estimating tau square. And every time we, we re estimate tau square, we're looking at the expected amount of, of sampling error. Remember, it's always the degrees of freedom and we're looking at the observed amount of, of variance, and we're comparing those. And all of these things are subject to sampling error. In a primary study, there is no within-person within pe sampling error, so we're, we're always working from the same baseline. The expected within-person error is always, is always going to be the same. It's always going to be zero. Whereas over here, it keeps changing every time we do another analysis. And therefore, while in the population, the amount of variance explained can't go down. The way that we're estimating these things, um, it, it can't. Remember I said before that when we're estimating tau square within subgroups, each one of them is subject to sampling error and therefore it might make sense to pull them. Well, it's the same thing over here. Now we're estimating tau square within every level of, of latitude. And in every case we're saying, well, this is how much sampling error we'd expect to see and this is how much we see. There's a lot of error in making those estimates and therefore, if we have, let's say in the analysis where we used only latitude, we underestimated the actual sampling error. And therefore, most of the error, that, most of the variance that we see, we say, you know, that's, that's real. And then in the next one, where, where we are um, controlling, where, where we're taking account of both latitude and year, in this case, we happen to overestimate the sampling error by a little bit. The point is these things, the difference that you're seeing um, is, is due just to the fact that these estimates are imperfect. Um, it's not that it doesn't make sense, it's just limits of, of the technology that we're using. Uh, in general, you won't see this, but in this case, you did. Yeah. Okay, that, yeah, well, it's, it's, um, that's the reason back here on the main screen. <coughs> if I understood your question, you're asking, is it possible that one study can really pull this one way or the other? And the answer is, it's exactly the same as it was in a fixed effect analysis. Let me see back over here, we're back on this screen, and if I click down at the bottom fixed, look at the difference between the amount of weight that this study gets versus this study. So using a fixed effect analysis, the, the analysis is pretty much dominated by this one over here and these two over here. They're controlling almost everything. Whereas if you move to a random effects analysis, these studies are given much more even weights. Now, if you had one particular study out here, uh, can that pull it? Yeah, it, it would. And then when you go to the um, diagnostics, um, you can see you know, how much each of these, how much of an impact these have. I don't even remember what each of these means, they're described in the, in the manual, but there's something called leverage, which I think is the impact that each study has on the overall effect size, and there are various other things. And as was the case with, a, with a, a simple analysis, if it turns out that there's one study that's really pulling everything way off course, you might want to look at that you know, and consider how much of an impact it's having. If, if your overall conclusion is that latitude has this major relationship to treatment effect, then it turns out that's all uh, traces back to a single study, then you want to be careful what you say about that. Uh, coming back to the um, modify models, I want to make sure I have time to show you this before we break for lunch. Let's say I'm going to get rid of these two for the moment, and I'm going to add allocation to the, um, to the model. But allocation, remember, is a, is a categorical variable. 
Now, most people here, I'm sure, are familiar with dummy coding. Okay, so that if you have a categorical variable like, like gender, then you put it into this as, as, you know, it can be, let's say, call it male, and it's coded one for male or zero for female. Or you code it, you call it female, and you code it one for female and zero for male. If you have something which has three categories like this, uh, there are three groups that are possible. There's the alternate group, the, s the random group, and the systematic. If I choose random as my reference group, and I add to model, what we're going to get over here, see the program has just created on the fly two dummy coded variables. One is, it's going to be coded one if they were alternate and zero otherwise. The next one is going to be coded one if it's systematic and zero otherwise. And the group that was um, randomized, that's my, that's my reference group. Now, if I go and run the analysis, and uh, notice also that the program has now put a little um, bracket around these, because it knows that when I look at this, I'm probably going to want to look at the impact of allocation as a set, rather than just looking at the, any one of these rows alone. And I have deselected these two, so I'm simply going to be running an analysis for, for these two guys over here. I run the regression. Um, I can get a p-value just for uh, using alternate allocation, just for using systematic allocation. But probably what I really care about is this Q statistic over here, which is the, uh, the which gives me a p-value for, for the set, which basically is, you know, how were they, how were they allocated? Was it alternate or systematic or uh, randomized? And the p-value for that is 0.48. Now, in this case, the only two, um, you'll notice down here the p-value 0.48 is the same as the one that we see over there, because what we're asking the same question. Do all the covariates together explain a significant amount of variance? And in this case, all of the covariates together are included in that set. Uh, and then again, we get these things like R-square. In this case, the R-square uh, analog is zero, because they really don't explain anything at all. Um, if I go to run the scatter plot, now what I get is, is something um, like this, where we actually have a, uh, a column of studies, one for randomized, one for alternate, and one for systematic. But if I come back over here, notice this. The p-value that I'm getting for allocation is 0.487. If I go back to the main screen, um, And I have the option over here of running an analysis and grouping by allocation. And you see over here I have, you know, a couple of studies here and a couple of studies here and so on. And then I go to the uh, next table. The p-value that I get is point, what, what did I say before, 4A7? Is that right? I, 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 it should be exact. So. If I show more decimals over here, 4880, is that what I saw? Yes? Okay. I mean, the, the point is that the analysis that we're doing over here, and in this case, we actually have three subgroups rather than two. This test over here asks if there's a difference among these effect sizes, which is exactly the same thing we're doing in a, in a meta regression. And so it follows that the p-value should be the same, and in fact, it is. What we can do in the meta regression, which we can't do here, is look at the impact of allocation, covarying latitude or covarying year. So if we come back to the um, meta regression, okay, I've got to turn off the grouping. Uh, analysis, meta regression. And I can put in, um, let's say, latitude and allocation. And um, I'm going to tick both of those. And now I run the analysis. Again, the program is giving me a p-value for this two, these two as a set. But now it's these two as a set partialing latitude. And now the p-value that I see over here is going to be for these two partialing latitude, whereas the p-value that I see over here is for all three together. And that's the reason that the program allows you to define these sets. Because often, when you're looking at a set, you're looking at that set partialing other, other things. I should point out, by the way, I mean, I showed you an example where the set was created automatically by the program because it, it knows that you probably want 
to create one. You can also define your own sets. Let's say that you have uh, the, um, a, a linear relationship and a curvilinear relationship, and you want to know if those two together explain some of the treatment effect. You just say um, you would highlight those things. Let, let me come back over here to modify the models. And let's say I'm going to add year back into the equation. And I'm going to take it over here and move it up. Move it up. And now I want to define a new set which includes both latitude and year. I think that they are related in some way. And I want to see if those two together explain a significant amount of the variance. I simply highlight the two of them. I click link covariates. And I'm going to call this simply a test. And now I have a set in there which includes both of these things. And if I run the analysis, I'm going to get a p-value for those two as a set partialing this, and for these two as a set partialing that. The basic idea is that the kinds of things that we normally would do in a multiple regression are available here. And what we've tried to do is to make some of them a little bit easier. Okay, any, any questions so far? Please. Uh, no, I mean controlling for the other one. So that basically when we're looking at latitude, we're looking at latitude within levels of year, within years. So that um, we're looking at the impact of latitude for all studies that were done in 1950, then the impact of latitude for all studies that were done in 1951. Now obviously there, there, there are, there's probably only one study that was done in 1950. But using, you know, sort of the covariance matrix and so on, it's able to sort of figure out uh, if you had a bunch of studies, you know, basically you're, you're, you're partialing it using the same kinds of things you do in a, uh, in a multiple regression. I, I probably should point out that I've only shown you about 10 or 20 percent of the kinds of things you can do with this module. And I, I don't think it would be fair to spend too much more time on this because we're going to lose time from, for other things. For anybody that's interested, the manual for this version of meta-regression is still, it's about 95 percent complete. If anybody, um, you know what, I'll just send it to everybody. Um, if you need to do a meta-regression soon, it, it, it's good. It's just not complete yet. Um, so you can, uh, you can use it, but we will be updating it over the next couple of months. And when it's finally updated, we're going to start releasing it in a more general format. I need to point out a couple of other things. Somebody in the back, it might have actually been you who asked the question yesterday. No, I think it was somebody else asked the question yesterday about why we're using the Z distribution rather than the T distribution. And I said I would say something about that when we came to meta-regression. It turns out that um, right now all of the statistics that we're looking at are based on Z. But um, in some cases, the, uh, people have pointed out that Z makes sense for figuring out what the error is within studies because generally we have a very large sample size. But when we're dealing with something like this where we have only a small number of studies, um, so that the, the between study variance, it might be more relevant to use T rather than Z. Uh, at the same time, you don't want to use T because while T might be, basically Z is appropriate for the within study error, T, T is appropriate for the between study error. So these uh, people called Knapp and Hartung developed a formula which uses uh, Z for part of the variance and T for the other part. And additionally, when testing this for statistical significance, it tests it against the F distribution rather than the Q distribution. So if I click now Hartung, you see that all of the statistics change. And now I'm looking at F values rather than Q values. And up here, I'm looking at T values rather than Z values. Now Hartung is always more conservative than Z. And it's probably a good idea to use it. And you'll see down here also that all these statistics have changed from Q to F, and that follows through, through the program. Other things that you can do, I, didn't speak, I did not speak about this, but you should be aware that there are several ways of estimating to a square. The method that I showed you is probably certainly the most common method. It's called the method of moments, and it's also known as the Dersimonian and Leard method. And that's basically a one-step method. And I showed you the logic of that yesterday afternoon You figure out how much how much variance you'd expect based on sampling error. You look at how much you have, and the difference gives you to a square. There are other methods of estimating to a square. One is called the maximum likelihood, and one is called restricted li maximum likelihood. In the manual, we talk about when you might want to use one of those. 
Um, in general, I, I, method of moments is probably the most robust. But if you want to use one of the others, you just click on it, and then all of the statistics change. At least if tor square is estimated as greater than zero, all of the statistics will change. You have the option over here of, of how many decimals to display for everything. So for example, you might want to display more decimals for a p-value. Um, you have, again, the tutorial. And oh, this is really in useful. Um, let's say that I, you know, I have this thing over here. I've set up this fairly complex model. And I'm not going to show you this now, but you don't have to set up only one model. You can set up 10 models. You can, my first model includes these five covariates. My next model includes you know, these five plus an additional three. And then in some of these screens over here, it will actually compare any one model to any other model. So you're actually looking at the increment due to um, the addition of a whole bunch of covariates rather than a single covariate. So you, you, can do, you can set up some pretty complex things over here, and you don't want to have to do that every time you come back to the program. So you can take this thing over here, say file, save, as, um, oh, this is interesting. I didn't know. Okay. <laughs> well, for, you know, I'm not trying to be funny. This is what happens when you get to be my age and don't have enough coffee. But look at what happens over here. Save the results as an Excel file and open. And I'm just give it some name called test. And then it basically is going to take everything I had over here and open it in Excel. So that if I wanted to then go ahead, maybe I'm writing a report and I needed a particular format, I get it in Excel and I can, you know, make it all pretty and everything and draw lines around it and then uh, you know include it in my report and I believe this also holds true for all of the other things so for example if I go to the line that talks about all studies and then I say file save results as Excel and open and I'm going to call this test 2 so we get all of that information out in Excel and we can look at it over there and do whatever we want to with it the part that I was trying to show you <laughs> was that if we come back to the screen over here, you say file, save regression file. Basically, you know how like in SPSS or Stata, you have your data file, and then you have your, your syntax file, and then you can take that syntax file and open it and use it with any data file. I can save this regression file and call it test3. And that's going to basically be saving all of the models that I defined over here um, and as I said, this happens to be one, but I, I can define a whole series of models, and it gets fairly complicated. Then the next time I come back to CMA, when I come back to this screen, I can simply open this up, and it's almost like opening up the whole syntax, you know, include this, include this, include this, and basically the screen will then reappear the way it did over here. What's nice about this is I can go back and use the same thing with a different data set. So either you know, if, if I maybe go back to my original data set, let's say that originally I had 30 studies, and now I want to work with only 20 of them, I can come back and rerun the regression. Or if I have a completely separate set of studies with the same variables, I can come back and use the same thing with that. Um, and again, there are other things. For example, this thing called generate a sequence, where it will generate a sequence of, of models, so that here's a model with just one covariate, and then two, and then three, and then four and then I run the regression, and then this is the model with one covariate, and this one I've added latitude, here I've added year, here I've added this, so that you can very quickly, it's the kinds of things that normally you would need to do, you know, by actually running a series of these things, and here it does it all for you behind the scenes. It's a little bit like yesterday, but I showed you with one study removed, that you can, you can get it done by going back and removing one study at a time and rerunning the analysis, but here it's all done in one click, and the nice thing about this also is that even though we're talking about five separate models, in a sense, you can then look at all the results for all of them at one time. For example, this screen over here is showing you the, the, the p-value for a difference between the model that includes um, all, everything, uh, everything including uh, latitude, year, and allocation versus the model that includes only um, only latitude or whatever, I have to scroll back, but whatever is on, is on that line. So that it, it's basically just a matrix showing you every possible comparison of these things. And it's not necessary the, that each model is the same as the other one plus one. It could be the same as the other one plus five or, or plus anything. I know there were a number of questions. Let's try to handle those before we break. Um, questions? Okay. So we're going to break for lunch. We'll reconvene at 1.30. 
And then I have another example of a regression that you can work through. And then we'll move on to conceptual issues and then to more complex um, data sets. Okay. I, I realize this, this last part on regression was probably uh, somewhat complicated. Um, for people that normally use uh, multiple regression, I hope the general outline of this was clear, but I, I recognize it's, you know, it's, 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 it's difficult to go through this kind of information in a, you know, just an hour. I hope I sort of gave you the, the basics. Okay. <laughs>